Thanks to all of you for coming here on a Friday night. My name is Deborah Kaufman. I am a journalist. Um, currently, I'm associate editor of Creative Cow. I also um, run, operate um, a website called Mobilize TV about uh, mobile content. And I still write for Variety, and I've written for um, a number of other publications in the industry. And we have gathered a really fabulous panel. I'll start directly to my right and move on down. Right next to me is B. Ottinger, who um, I believe you edited the first music video. No. No, that's not entirely true. But the best things I did are things people think I did and didn't do. But didn't you do one of the very earliest music videos? Um, oh, yes, I did. See? Actually, but it wasn't on TV. Oh, it wasn't on TV. It was Cher Roller Skating Disco in 1979. It played in every gay bar in the country. There you go. It took three weeks to negative cut it. B has been an editor for, well, you've heard it, at least since 1979. And um, she owned her own editing facility, Skylight Productions, for quite a while. Uh, and then later, she worked at Mad River Post and Rock, Paper, Scissors. <clears throat> and the bulk of your experience is in short form, correct? Short, short form. And you also teach editing. She teaches <laughs> editing. OK. Next to her, a Derek McCant specializes in nonfiction editing, which includes documentaries for PBS Nova and reality TV, Top Gear, The World According to Paris, Sarah Palin's Alaska. I noticed you did Big Brother. Mm -hmm. He's done them all. Next to him is Andrew Seckler. If you like sci-fi, you've seen his work. <laughs> um, he's currently, you're working on a show called Alcatraz now, right? right? Yeah. But his past credits in TV include Battlestar Galactica, Caprica, Warehouse 13, and I'm sure other credits yeah. you might want to mention. Next to him, we have Mark Goldblatt, who's been an editor at least 30 years, right? At least. Yeah. So, <laughs> at least. We'll so, just cap it at that. You will cap it at that. And his credits include the recent Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Awesome job. But he's also done Terminator 2, Judgment Day, True Lies, Starship Troopers, Pearl Harbor, X-Men Last Stand, and many a others. Few others. And a few others. So I'm curious, how many of you out there make your living as an editor? Ooh. OK. Great. About half. About half. And then of those who do not make their living as an editor, how many of you edit? <laughs> right. So. Anybody left over? I don't think it does. It, anybody not edit? Does anyone know what editing is at all? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that's certainly one thing that's changed. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little Definitely, bit. I mean, yeah. it used to be that uh, <clears throat> the bar of entry was high because it was film, and now the bar of entry is $900, right? Yeah. Um, or less. 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 less 300 Yeah. Free. Or free. Or free. Thank you. Or free. I thought this would be interesting because we do have people, um, you know, career paths in editing have been really different. To talk a little bit about your backgrounds and how you came to editing, because not everybody goes straight to editing. They come at it from different points of view. So, Mark, do you want to start off? All right. I'll try to do this in a abridged version. All right. I was always one of these young film nut type people who was always into movies from point, since I could remember. So I had my first movie camera when I was like 11. And it wasn't long after that that I had my little editing machine with my cement splicing block. So I was actually editing little movies that I would make uh, with my friends and stuff, and then just travelogues. And then later years, I would just carry a camera around. So I was always editing, interestingly enough. Uh, but you know, for some reason, as much as I love movies, uh, I didn't really think about having a career making movies. It was like a dream that I just thought I wasn't going to get into. So I did a liberal arts degree. You know, I was a philosophy major in college and stuff, but I was still making my little movies and putting them together. And uh, you know, then uh, it was like, well, now I'm out in the work world, and what kind of job can I get? Uh, I got a job like in the men's clothing business. Uh, which, which I think is metaphorically something that editors can relate to because they have a cutter. You know, I, I wasn't the cutter, but the cutter had a big noisy machine, just kind of like what movieolas were, and they would put these suits together, you know, according to a plan. But anyway, that wasn't the right kind of cutting for me. So I, I finally realized I really, really, really needed to work in movies. I had to figure out how to do it, and I, I, I knew that it meant a certain amount of training. It was either like take. Take the first job. Now, by the way, uh, there's something to be said for taking that first entry-level job of getting coffee and donuts 
to the set if that's the first entry level job. I didn't do that. I opted to go to film school. I found a film school in London, England called the London Film School that was uh, non-academic. It was a trade school and it was about learning a trade. And they had really great uh, English directors, uh, producers, uh, editors, cameramen, stuff like that. You'd learn everything. So I learned how to take a Mitchell camera apart, put it back together. I, I, I studied editing with a guy named Frank Clark who edited Blow Up for Antonioni mm -hmm. and a lot of great films at MGM until they closed that studio. So, and, and it was really inexpensive and I was able to get a job at the school as well to help supplement it. I think it was like uh, $1,000 a year to go to this school. So a very different trajectory. Uh, so I graduated from that in 74, came out to Hollywood, here I am, no phone calls, nobody's beating down the door to hire me. So what did I do? I finally, through painstaking, uh, knocking on doors, sending out resumes and stuff, got an opportunity to deliver coffee and donuts to the set. <laughs> See, now maybe I could have bypassed film school, I'll never know. But I, the thing is, I learned all this stuff. I actually could edit. At the same time, I got a job assisting a guy who was an editor at Universal at a place called Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. I don't know if anyone remembers this place. Yes. And, and they would teach, did you teach that? I took a class, that's my. Well, I used to night manage the place occasionally. Maybe that's it, anyway. Leon Ortiz Gill was the editor. He, he did um, Beretta. Yes. We, in fact, we I used edited to, Beretta footage. Did you edit Beretta? That was his course. He brought in dailies. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 <laughs> the, the, oh, amazing. I, I, I was assisting him. Oh, yeah. So for that, I got very little money, but I got to take any classes there I wanted to take, which was great. They were great. Because they'd have people like Sam Fuller, the great American director, yeah. come there and talk about directing, and you'd be talking to him, and he'd, yeah. He'd be showing you how he takes the camera off the tripod and gets on the floor and shoots low angle up shots and stuff. Anyway, but I digress. So what, what, what happened to me was I learned that there was a difference in just the methodology of day-to-day -day editing in Hollywood as opposed to England. England had different kinds of equipment. I mean, their splicers were different. They used uh, guillotine splicers and with perforated tapes, but we usually use rebus splicers. I learned how to do the the two uh, perf splice, uh, learned how to use the razor blade, learned how to do acetone wipes and all this stuff. So that was great, and then finally I just bluffed my way into, in fact, one day I went to see a movie called Death Race 2000 at the World Theater on a triple bill, and it blew me away. And I said, that's it. I'm going into Roger Corman's office. Roger Corman's a great movie director. I'm gonna get a job, and that's what I did. I went into the office, and said uh, to the secretary, who do I talk to about getting a job in editing? So, I mean, because editing, I discovered in film school was the thing I really liked to do. And she said, oh, talk to that guy over there, who turned out to be the head of advertising who was about to uh, produce his first movie, $60,000 budget, 10-day shoot. We hit it off because he was a total film freak like I was, with a specialized, uh, he loved horror films, so do I, and, but we also, knew, you know, European films, everything. It's like, if you're a total film freak, you know everything. So yeah, so I took this job for no money, which later I said, no, you gotta pay me, because I was working 18 hours a day, <laughs> and, and my car was working. And I uh, said, okay, we'll give you $60 a week, non-retroactive. But that job led to a job on another picture that paid two and a half times that, $60. <laughs> and, and then I met, uh, Joe Dante, who was editing at the time, and I became his assistant, and then I became his editor and co-editor on the pictures he directed, and Alan Arkish, and other New World alumnus, and lots of other people, and I just kept doing these films. Now, in those days, we had exploitation films like Piranha, which was my first editing credit, and they, you know, I don't know that there is anything like that anymore. That's the only thing. So I can only tell you my experience. I was in the right place at the right time, and I worked on these really cool movies with really talented people that actually got seen. See, if it gets seen, and if it makes money, well, that helps. Then somebody may want to hire you back. That was the Roger Corman School. So many people were, were born from Roger Corman's studio. Yeah, that was a godsend. It was. Andrew. Well, I wasn't really a film you know, enthusiast growing up. I, I liked movies. I probably watched an unhealthy amount of television. I was always interested in art and narrative and stories and just actually verbal, like listening to people tell stories. I was always really, I, I loved that. I landed up in college going to a liberal arts <coughs> college as well. I studied philosophy, I studied literature, comparative literature, mm -hmm. 
a lot of art, a lot of fine art. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually, like by default, just declared myself an English major and landed up doing a double major in uh, creative writing and literature. I should mention, I think, one of the things that was probably formative in my life that I didn't realize until years later was my father was a amateur photographer and we had a dark room in our house. And I took a, cl a photography class, I think, when I was in like an eighth grade or something, and they said, go out and tell a story using a still 35 millimeter camera. So I took one of my dad's cameras and I went out and actually shot in camera a story kind of edited in little pieces and, you know, when you have to think that way of like how to frame a shot to tell a particular part of a story, it's really, you know, you're doing a very selective process which is a lot like editing and it's visual storytelling and I did that a few times growing up. I also studied art, so I studied at the American Academy of Fine Arts in New York and then later at the National Academy. So I was always drawing and, and illustrating my own stories and, and doing little books and things like that. So I was always interested in visual narrative and when I graduated I moved back to New York and really had no idea what I wanted to do. I landed up teaching in a public school in the South Bronx uh, as a substitute. It was pretty tough. It just wasn't really what I wanted to do. And I landed up getting a job in uh, publishing and doing children's books. And I convinced the, the company that I was working for to pay for graphic design classes. So one night I was walking out of there and I p passed by this room and these guys, I saw these guys in there and they were just hooting and hollering and having a great time and laughing and they were editing. And I was watching them like move images back and forth and make edits and they were like doing some sort of trailer or doing something for themselves. And I thought that's really fascinating. So I went back to the people I was working for and, um, and this is back in the early 90s when multimedia was sort of the big buzzword in publishing and I'm like, you know, more about this multimedia thing, you know, I really think I should do video editing. I really should learn video editing. Would you pay for a class for me to do video editing? And they said sure, so I kind of put the graphic design on hold. I took a couple classes to learn how to edit, and I just loved it. I just thought this is like, this is great. And it's a synthesis of everything I've always been interested in. It's <laughs> visual, it's storytelling, and all this stuff. So how did you fall into your first professional credit? Okay, so I'll fast forward. I came out here, I went to the American Film Institute for a year. I landed up doing sort of an unofficial second year where I cut a thesis film. And then right out of there, I got an assistant editing job on a, a film feature, it was cut on a movieola. Um, so I started in film and then for years worked as an assistant and at night would like cut a feature, like a low budget feature on a, you know, or a short and just sort of work my, th that way until I got a break. Well, actually, what I realized was it was very, gonna be very hard for me to break through in features. I had talked to a lot of assistants. They said, you know, I've, I've been assisting the same editor for 10 years and he's let me cut one scene. And I thought, God, you know, that's, I can't do that. So I landed up working on some pilots and through one of the pilots that I worked on, when it got picked up, I landed up getting a gig Great. as an editor. So it's like an advertisement for AFI. When I was accepted at the a AFI, there was this new thing called the Avid that I'd read about in a magazine and I called them and I said, do you have an Avid? And they said, we do. Okay, I'm going. <laughs> and I, I drove across country and I showed up at AFI in my U-Haul. I said, show me the Avid. And they took me in this room and they go, it's in those boxes over there. They hadn't, they hadn't even put it together yet. So Derek, mm -hmm. how did you get into editing? Um, well, I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. I, I majored in uh, creative writing. I was actually writing poetry and, I, and got some work published and edited a couple, a couple at least one literary magazine, um, but there was not a lot of money in that. Um, and that was in New England. So I came back to New York, my best buddy was uh, in lower Manhattan, um, making video art with uh, a porta pack which was half inch black and white reel to reel. I started writing grants for him, is actually how I got involved with the video art. Um, and we got uh, an a NEA grant which allowed us to build a little black and white studio in Tribeca. We created a six part um, series on Manhattan Cable. To edit those shows, um, we, I would take the uh, reel, the playback reel, back to the lower left hand screw. That was how we measured the pre-roll. Did the same thing on the record machine. Hit play and play and record and that's how we would edit. We uh, went from there to doing um, a fashion magazine on three-quarter inch cassette that was distributed to the fashion industry, uh, Video Fashion Monthly, and so my editing got a little more sophisticated, adding graphics and uh, text on screen, music, etc. but yeah. What was your first uh, thing that you did on an Avid? Wow, um, it was a music video. Um, it was 
I think on Avid number six. Uh, one company in New York had Avids, and uh, I convinced a music video client to use it um, t so that I could learn it. Uh. <laughs> that was the first job. Interesting, <laughs> very interesting. Okay, B. Yeah. So I also was a philosophy major. Isn't that strange? Ooh, philosophy and in creative a, writing. In a small uh, liberal arts school, very similar. And had absolutely no interest in film. As a matter of fact, I was kind of, I, my family did art, and we were East Coast, and it was um, the furthest thing from my mind to be in Hollywood or to, to be involved in the film industry. I, I was the opposite. I did not love film. I enjoyed films, but I didn't have the tingle of working in films. So I um, uh, started to be a photographer. That was really my interest. And I came out here to go to Cal Arts. And at a certain point, I just got tired. I got tired first of not having any money, but I also got tired of being alone, you know, just wandering the streets and in a dark room. And I just realized that as much as I loved, I loved seeing a frame. I just always loved seeing a frame. So I, someone said, why don't you try editing? And I said, what's editing? And they said, there's a school. And I had forgotten the name of that school until you said Sherman Oaks. And I took a class, and this guy, I don't know if he was a friend of yours, but he came drunk every night, and he just handed us film. <laughs> <laughs> told us how to turn on the movieola, and gave us this film, and gave the track of Beretta. Right, right And right. we were drawing, and I remember. That's right. Yeah, we had to draw and use leader and just like edit something. I loved it. I can't believe people are going to pay me to do this. It's everything I love about photography with people and sound and, and story, although I never was very, um, I'm not that good with, with story. I never was interested in it. And I wandered into Carol Littleton's office, for those of you who know Carol Littleton. And she hired me because I wasn't a film person. She was a linguist, she was an oboist, she didn't come from film, and she wanted someone to talk to. I could talk books and I could talk to, you know. Mm -hmm. And she said, the first thing she said, hand me an academy leader, and I said, what's an academy leader? And she kind of went, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but she taught me, I learned quickly. I really think because I had been staring at a frame for seven years, that I was able to move very quickly uh, into editing. I was editing in six months. I mean, not great stuff, but just progressive stuff. I did a reality show, very early re reality show. What was the reality show? Um, it was with that gal in, in Get Smart. Wait a second, Barbara Feldon? Yeah, do you know did that you show? I worked on that show. That's how I know you! <laughs> we, job. We've been trying to think how we knew each other. Amy Heckerling with, was one of them? Yes. yes. And um, David um, Boucher. Something? Yeah, Boucher. So. Boucher, and then the guy who came in at night. So you um, worked on that show together. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that was my first union <laughs> job. I was an assistant. I wasn't yours. I, that's how I know him. I was an assistant, but they always would throw us Alan stuff. Sloan. I, Alan, Alan Sloan. Sloan was Alan Sloan. Yeah. Alan Sloan did a reality show. He it was him and a lawyer and an accountant. Right. And that was it. And directors and editors. And what and they used it. to do, which was probably not on the up and up, but it was great for us, is they'd have the assistants editing, because you'd only do these little three-minute pieces. So they were just, you know, for us it was like, you're actually letting us edit? Wow. And you'd have like three days. Yeah. So I, I was always in, it seemed to be even as an assistant jobs where the editor, when the editor got sick and I had to do something and so I took her job. And I had the opportunity to edit film. But at that time, it, well, I was 28 and it was eight years of carrying film around. And if I had loved it, I would have done it, or gone the circus route that a lot of people did. But I just, I realized I didn't love it enough to carry film cans around. So I went another way, and I just was kind of doing just stuff. I uh, ended up in broadcast promotion. It was 30-second um, pieces, 60-second pieces, which is my format. I, I liked short stories. I like visual stories. And you cut in film, but you delivered in tape because it was only to one TV station. So I gradually started, I had to go to online and, you know, freeze frame the 60 second to make a 30 and it would take us an hour to get a good freeze frame. But <laughs> I, you know, it, it was, I wasn't afraid of it. And I also think the liberal, I don't know if you agree, but the liberal arts education, it's easier to learn something you don't know. I mean, people who love something and just do that, 
and then you get caught in a technology change and you're dead. You know, you don't like computers. Well, learn it. I felt I had trouble as a woman progressing as fast as I wanted to progress. I, that's not so true in film at those days. Mm -hmm. But I think it was true in video. They said, keep the broads out of broadcasting. Ooh. I mean, it was like, <laughs> no doubt about it. And they hated it when the two inch went to one inch because I couldn't carry, I could then carry for yeah. one inch. You know, yeah. it, I mean, it was pretty brutal. But I started my own company and um, started to do videotape, kept doing film, and then happened to just find jobs of cutting to music. I did a Olympic thing for Fidel Sassoon and the broadcast promotion. They'd sing a little song and say, we're for, you know, for Boston and people would, and I would just cut to music and then music videos came and that's really was right time, right place. They said, well, I think B does that. And so, <laughs> and then I got the Avid and then commercials moved. And so although I did commercials, when they moved from the MTV kind of cutting, came into commercials, they didn't know how to do it, so the director could choose their editor. So I was always with directors. I always worked with directors, which is unusual in commercials, usually your agency. I didn't really enjoy working with agencies, so it was a choice, you know. <laughs> really? <laughs> We're shocked, aren't we? Shocked. <laughs> Very interesting stories. Thank you all so much. Well, B, I'm, I'm actually going to start with a question that you posed, which I think is really great, which is to talk a little bit about your process. Because my guess is you all have slightly or maybe dramatically different processes. You know, Because most of my editing was, was music videos and music video style editing, um, rarely came in with a really strong storyboard. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'd get nervous if, if they did because it it was hard to keep the rhythm of a story. It was easier when um, it, was a, it was a little bit more visual, nice shots, and then you created the story and the rhythm. So the, it was very, very important, and I know everyone's going to say this because it's just absolutely true, is you have to look at the footage fresh. You cannot, you have to wipe everything off. I was talking to Mark, and he does meditation. I do yoga, and it's like, you just got to, get in that zone. You inevitably have some, something you're bringing to it. You're kind of starting to think a little bit, how am I going to use this? That's always in the back of your head, but you really want to evaluate the performance and the shot, and, and you want to watch your impression. You want to watch yourself watching. I would start doing selects right away and doing quite broad select. Do you take notes at all? I'm I never took notes. <laughs> Probably should have, but I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I, just a question. But I, mean, I was just pure. But 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 what I was cutting, it was appropriate. I think if right. other things. So it was just pure. What's a good shot? What's fun? What strikes me and everything? And then I start thinking, go back over it, get a little more discerning. And the wonderful thing about the Avid is his first select, second selects. You can just, you know, duplicate stuff. I mean, that just changed editing for me. I could make choices kind of before I was really ready to make choices because I knew it was real easy to go back to see mm -hmm. the other shots. And that changed my editing style completely. Derek? Do well, we it's a little different in a uh, reality series. Um, in, in documentaries, yeah, you do take the time to look at everything. Uh, you sometimes have a script, sometimes not. But with reality shows, we have shorter and shorter schedules, and so the process is a little different. You. Um, someone who screened the footage before you, usually, or made notes in the field. Who screened it before you, usually just whoever? Uh, producer, usually. Yeah, the producer. Do um, they give or there's you... a story department, sorry. Yeah. Do they give you time code? Or oh, yeah. Do they... Well, it sometimes goes beyond that. We have a story department, uh, usually, and they put together what's called a string out, which is just a very, very rough version of the story they want to tell. So they're kind of writing a script based on the material. Right. I thought it would, the whole idea of the predator was that editors were doing that. Oh, and it still it happens, yeah. It still happens, yeah. though. I've been in many situations where I'm just given a bunch of footage just dumped on me and said, you know, I'll see you in two weeks. And <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yeah. So it, it depends on the show, in other words. Yes. Or the production company, yeah. The production company, OK. Which do you like better? Um, well, I prefer looking at the footage fresh, finding the story in the footage, and being given the time to do that. In other words, that. doing your job, being an editor. Yeah as opposed to, here, follow this script. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we'll see it um, later today. <laughs> <laughs>
Is there a trend one way or the other, or is it just depends on the production? Yeah, I think the companies are veering more towards providing you with a lot of support, giving you the um, uh, the string out, <clears throat> and but basically you're refining that. Um, hopefully, you're given some time to go back to the to the footage. Um, because I, I prefer, even though I've created the string out or refined a string out, I prefer to go back to the source footage and, and see if there's something better. And uh, are they open to that? Oh, yeah. I had this image of more like, here's two weeks worth of you know, footage, or here's all this footage, I'll see you in two weeks kind mm -hmm. of scenario, and that you've got to you know, dig it out, dig mm -hmm. the story out of that stuff. But this is, you know, it seems like they're more managing the stories. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of reality is a producer construct. Well, yes. We know, yeah. we know that, but they're really, you know, putting a, a layer above in managing some of these stories. Yeah, I mean, you realize that sometimes we're putting together a half-hour show in a week. Can I tell one story about the Avid? When I was at a u first user group, and they had the first editor who edited a feature on the Avid, and they, we said, "How was it?" He said, "Well, it used to be, I would uh, get changes, and uh, they'd give me three weeks." to do the changes and everything. And with the Avid, I gave it to them in a week. And they were, they just loved it. They loved it. And the next time there were changes, he said, well, I'll give it to you in a week. And he, they said, can you give it to us tomorrow? Right. <laughs> and that's what happened. 